Please welcome your panelists for Entitlements, a collision course with fiscal reality, moderated by Business Insider Senior Editor Josh Barrow. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to the panel on entitlements, which I know is the uh, sexiest topic being discussed at uh, Milken today. <laughs> Um, we're here to talk about the future of what are called mandatory spending programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment insurance, and other programs to which a person is entitled based on qualifying criteria. If you're entitled, you get the benefit, and that certainty helps people plan their finances. But the entitlement structure also means that these programs' costs can grow in a way that is not reviewed year to year by Congress. And over the long run, uh, as our population ages, as medical expenses outpace inflation, that means that these programs take up a larger percentage of the economy. And in time, that means you need to find a way to pay for that, whether that's higher taxes, cuts to other government programs, or you can change the rules about what people are entitled to in order to bring that math into line. But of course, it's not just a math problem. It's also a question of our values as a society and what we want out of these government programs. Um, and so to discuss all of those questions and, and what to do about them, I think we have a really uh, solid panel on this today. Uh, Jared Bernstein uh, is an economic policy fellow here at the Milken Institute and is a senior fellow at the Center on Budget Policy Priorities. He was also Joe Biden's chief economist. Um, Andrew Biggs is a, rel is a resident scholar at uh, the American Enterprise Institute, which is a conservative think tank. Uh, and previously, he was deputy commissioner of the Social Security Administration. Um, Chris Hughes is a co-founder of Facebook. He now chairs the Economic Security Project, through which he's campaigning for a significant expansion of income support in the United States. And Maya McGinnis uh, is the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, uh, which is an anti-deficit uh, policy group in Washington. Um, so we'll, we'll take questions from the audience uh, in the last 15 minutes of this session. I want to start by talking about the title. Um, the title is a collision course with fiscal reality. And I think at least two of the panelists up here are likely to <laughs> object to that framing in the title. Um, so let's, I, I want to start with the affirmative case. So Maya, uh, is there a collision course here? What is the scope of the problem that we're looking at? OK, so we'll take away aside the words entitlements, collision, and all the things that people might not like. like. <laughs> but there, I was just thinking when you were giving the intro that so much of this discussion is probably more of a values discussion. What do you think that these programs should look like? How do we want to have our resources spread in this country? Um, and those are issues where there's no right and wrong. Um, you wouldn't know that from how it feels in DC, where mm -hmm. everything that one person says is right and it's wrong to somebody else. But those are values choices. I do think we have a huge problem in our Social Security and Medicare programs in that we have promised more in benefits than we have on track to come into the program. So there's not enough revenues that's coming into the program to pay the promised benefits. And to me, however you want to fix that, whether it's all by cutting promised benefits, whether it's all by raising taxes, by it's some combination of those, um, I'd throw things like raising the retirement age in there, um, we should be doing something. Because the thing that we shouldn't be doing is having promised people benefits that we have no plan how to pay for. So I don't know if you want to use the word collision. I know there's some questions about the word entitlement. But I think we have things that are actuarially unsound. I, w <laughs> I, was, I was once dial tested, and someone said, never say actuarially unsound. <laughs> it's like the least likable person. But um, yeah. which like, it was kind of a mean. I didn't know I was being dial tested. It was just a mean trick. But um, the trust funds will run out of resources. And the problem is that our policymakers use these programs as punching bags. They fight so much over them instead of figuring out, let's debate how we're going to fix them. But I think we should be able to agree that you need to set them up so that they are actuarially sound. So Jared, I, I, I think you would agree with all of that, right? Or yeah, I would add a couple of the nuances. The un unlikable part? Yeah, no, not that part. <laughs> I totally reject the unlikable part. I think yeah. Maya is super likable. Um, yeah, I, I would. I, I would I, I, Maya knows this, but just to flesh out a nuance that I think is important, um, though the trust fund is slated to expire by 2034, that doesn't mean Social Security stops paying benefits. In fact, the incoming tax base supports benefits to the tune of about 75 percent of current benefits. Now, I consider that to be uh, an avoidable tragedy that we should avoid. <laughs> um, uh, but I did want to make clear that uh, sometimes it is cast, not by my, right. it is cast as, uh, you know, things are just going to end at that point. So 
you know, I wouldn't call that a collision by, by any stretch of the imagination. I think of a collision as something that's unavoidable and it's, it's going to happen any minute if you don't uh, do what you need to do. But no question, the debate, uh, I like Maya's framing in terms of, of, of values, but at, at some point uh, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in resolving uh, the, uh, uh, the fiscal gaps that we're talking about, yeah, we're going to have to come up with some combination, uh, in my view, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of revenue increases and perhaps some uh, benefit cutbacks, particularly at the very top of the scale. That, that's, going to be, that's going to have to be uh, the formula. I will say, my, my last comment just to, as part of an introduction, is that while there may have been, a, if not momentum because it's Washington, at least some consensus among sort of center left to center right that that was going to have to be the, uh, the, the solution to, to the uh, entitlement challenge, uh, that's kind of been blown out of the water by the tax plan. Uh, the tax plan, uh, to my great dismay, um, has really thrown a wrench in, what, uh, in, in our ability to come together and solve this in a, in a meaningful way. I'll be happy to talk about why I think that's the case, but I'm pretty sure that's the political reality. So, um, actually, can we bring up slide two? I'm going to call for, for Jared's slide at this point. Um, so, I, I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this panel on like specific tinkering to yeah. formula as to what we might do. But just, I, I want to give this sort of sense of scale because I think, you know, we, Social Security and Medicare being the biggest slices of this, Medicare has all these unknowns about the future track of, of health care costs and it's very complicated. Social Security is fairly simple. It's, you know, there's money comes in, money goes out, you change the rules around that, you can always make the math add up. So what, are, what is the, can, can you just talk a little bit about like what yeah. the nature of these things are that you might do? Sure, I, I, I'm glad you, you raised that because um, uh, that's why I put the slide in here. Yeah. Um, so so the, 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 the shortfall, the, this, <laughs> I'm not gonna say actuarial, oh, I just said it. The, the actuarial shortfall, 1% of GDP over 75 years, which by the way, is really worth keeping in mind. Uh, uh, um, the way CBO talks about it, it's 1% over 10 years, and I have to tell you, that's about the cost of the tax cut. Um, <laughs> uh, each, one of these, uh, each one of these bars tells you how much of that actuarial gap would be closed by, for example, raising the payroll tax rate. I, I'm sure you can't read the, yeah. the note there, but it's a, a slow increase of about a point in the payroll tax rate. That closes half the gap, and so on. Uh, increase the tax max. That's the maximum amount of earnings that are taxed. Uh, it, People talk about that as raising, el eliminating the cap. Well, that's on, the on next the one is eliminating it. It's, uh, it's, it's oh, I see. Trap yes. the cap yes. is the next one, but the first mm -hmm. one would just, uh, would just raise it. So mm -hmm. the cap used to cover 90% of earnings. Now it covers about 83% of earnings. Raise the cap, you capture, you close about a, a fifth of the gap, et cetera. And, um, and uh, the th the, I put in the last bar because I think it's, it's instructive, although I think we could probably have some and probably will argue about it a little bit. Um, this, is, this, is the, this is the benefit cut that some people sort of left of center would agree with. This is, uh, I, I can't quite read what it says, but it's- Reduce uh, benefits for higher earnings. Yeah, so, this is so, so, so this, this is just reducing uh, the benefit payout to the highest earners so that, you know, I, a lot of us walk around thinking, well, gee, if we have a, a financing crunch, why should, you know, Bill Gates uh, uh, get, uh, get Social Security benefits? And we probably all agree that that would be a, a fine place to start. The problem is you get very little revenue there because Social Security is a pretty progressive program. So the problem is once you start trying to uh, achieve solvency by cutting benefits, uh, my concern is that you'd get too far down into the distribution and you'd have to start essentially breaking Social Security to fix it. So I guess, the, can we, if we can put that slide up again, um, Andrew, when, when we had a call before this discussion, you talked some about uh, your disappointment that there hadn't been more innovation in these programs, finding ways to, to do better with the same amount of money. And I think, you know, in, in healthcare, there's a lot of concern about that. But isn't, is it wrong to think about Social Security basically as a math question like this? You do some combination of taxing people more or giving people fewer benefits than they retire, and then we need a political question about what do we want? Do we want higher taxes? Do we want lower benefits? Lower benefits for whom, et cetera? Well, I'm, I'm glad Jared put up the slide in the sense it gives me something to, to play off of. And I don't think, it, I, I don't think the, the, I'm not saying these numbers are wrong. And certainly, you know, I can kind of sort of play that game in, in a sense of picking things off a menu and saying, how do we get to actuarial balance? But I remember in 2005, I worked in the Bush White House on Social Security reform when President Bush was doing the road show and the whole deal. 
and they looked at it very much from this standpoint of getting even more in the weeds of all playing with the growth rates, these different factors in the, in the, in the benefit formula. And I remember talking to one of the president's advisors, and I just asked him rhetorically, why do we have a Social Security program? What do you want this thing to do? And I got this blank look back, and that's when I knew we were screwed. <laughs> it was, but, but the point is, they were talking, and the president knew, I mean, whatever his reputation was, he understood all this minutia of the formula, and he'd talk in terms of the minutia, but nobody had any idea what he was talking about. And, or I did, but nobody, <laughs> nobody else. But it's, it, the way I tend to think about this is, it's just it was a rhetorical advice of asking myself, if we had to start a social security program from scratch today, what would it look like? And the answer is it probably would not look like the social security program was invented in 1935, because things are different today. And so I think th people in Washington, D.C., they get so tightly wound up in the current program. And part of this is because you have this trust fund deficit and all that. We focus very much on the financing of the program. We have almost no focus on whether the program actually works or not. So we say, you know, does it get the goals that you want it to achieve of having retirement security for people, you know, reducing poverty and old age without, say, harming private retirement savings, without harming people's incentives to work, without harming their incentives to delay retirement? We don't even ask those questions because we're so focused and fixated on this financing problem. So when I ask myself, what would we do if we had to invent this from scratch today? It, gives, it, it gets away from all that stuff. And, and it says, what do we want this thing to accomplish? And I can give you, obviously, my ideas on that. Other people might have different ones. But I think it's good to start from scratch and say, what are our policy goals? Because I think that opens things up, both in terms of engaging Americans of this kind of debate that is not just this mumbo jumbo, but also presents new and different policy ideas. I mean, if you look around the world, there's different ways that countries go about providing retirement security to people. And there's a lot more policy innovation that goes on in other countries than goes on today. We're very wedded to these formulas, particularly with Social Security. And at the end of the day, I think it's just a counterproductive kind of argument to have. But so just to, to, to break down what, what that would mean, I, I, are you talk if, if you could <laughs> mute that, please. Um, the, uh, the models that you see in other countries, like in, in the UK, for example, is the idea to talk more about like a flat basic benefit. Mm -hmm. But so then, isn't that just sort of an extreme version of the of the formula reimagination? It's like a it basically like a big reduction in social security payments for the middle and and upper class. If you wanted to mathematically translate it, you could. Yeah. But I'll just tell you what I've thrown out as an idea for for social security reform. It's modeled very closely after what they have in New Zealand, where essentially a flat dollar benefit payment to every retiree that is guaranteed to lift you above the, the poverty line. I don't care whether you've contributed to the program. I don't care how rich you are. Everybody is getting this, because the government's job is to take is people who can't or who, or for whatever reason <clears throat> won't save on their own. People with very low income. Government's jobs, let's prevent those people from retiring into poverty. We can afford to do that very, very easily. For middle and upper income people, Social Security is just basically a forced savings program. There's not, I mean, okay, you got the disability survivor side, but the retirement part of Social Security is you put money in, you get money out. There is no reason why that should be run through this pay-as-you-go program with this kind of phony trust fund. If you want people to save, just set them up so they save. So it's the difference, though, between that kind of program and converting the current formula to be that way is if you say we're going to have a flat dollar benefit for everybody getting above poverty and then you're going to save, a normal human being knows what you're talking about. I could translate the Social Security benefit formula to approximate that, but nobody but me is going to understand it. So we have to have a, a policy conversation of what do we want to do? What is government's job? What is government's obligation? What do we expect people to do on their own? You know, what, what might we require them to do on their own? Say, make everybody pay into a 401k or whatever. But it, it doesn't need to be as complicated as it is. And by making it complicated, I think it's really counterproductive. Yeah, I just, I just sort of I feel like this doesn't get us out of any of the the, the map problems that we have. No, no. Basically, you know, you can substitute private saving for government saving, but people still need approximately the same amount of saving. It's well, so the, yes, the, yes and no, in, in in the sense that I'm not going to play some sort of rate of return argument or whatever. But think how how do you think about the money you pay into Social Security versus the money you pay into your 401k? In theory, they're the, they're the same thing. It's money coming out of your pockets, money you can't spend today. If you ask people, which do you feel more secure in? I mean, like Ebree just came out with a retirement confidence survey. 
People feel confident in the money they save on their own. They do not feel confident in the money that's going into Social Security. And, and so, so it, it's do you think just... That Jared, do you think that describes people's actual retirement behavior? Do they retire? No, like I don't. I mean, sure I, I, so I think, you know, so I have many, many objections to uh, <laughs> Andrew's ideas, although I, I think he explains them very coherently, and, and he has a coherent plan. But um, what you're essentially talking about, see, I think Social Security works really, really, really well. And yes, it's old, but so am I. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Not that old. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, maybe I don't work that well either. But, uh, but uh, it, is a, it is the only guaranteed, vested, portable pension program we have in this country. And if you were to make that into a poverty program, which is kind of what I hear you describing, uh, not only do you significantly dimin diminish uh, the retirement security that Social Security uh, delivers, but you're also now putting it into a realm of programs that uh, are you know, massively and will continue to be massively under, fu under fire by uh, conservatives who are trying to make them go away. So it's sort of like Grover Norquist, get it small enough so you can drown it in the bathtub. Uh, Social Security has been, um, uh, has had tremendous political support in large part because it's not uh, that type of a program. So uh, I think that uh, the uh, financing uh, challenges remain and we're going to have to uh, solve them and we can have a good conversation about how to do that. But boy, this is a pro, you know, when I listen to Andrew, my main thought is this, this program ain't broke. Don't fix it, especially when fix it requ requires it, in my, at least in my view, in, in breaking it. Okay. Chris, I, I want to I bring you in because you, your project is about significantly expanding the entitlement state. Um, and so I guess, you know, the, uh, very often entitlement conversations are framed sort of the way this one is mm. in the Milken Guide. You know, the math doesn't add up. We need to find ways to cut. So what's, you want basic, it, it's, it's, a, it's a large expansion of the earned income tax credit, more or less. So what would, what would you do there, and then how would you finance it? Well, I would say two things, just sitting here listening to the debate that's already starting. I guess I'm sort of the, the millennial voice on the panel. If I'm, uh, that's, uh, that's a little bit of my foil. And I would say, first off, a lot, most young people in the country don't expect Social Security to be a real source of, of security in their old age. Ironically, the same generation is the one that is coming of age in the moment of the gig economy. Not just Uber drivers and Lyft drivers, but you know, nearly all the jobs we've created in the past 10 years, part-time, contract, temporary. So our experience uh, is one of incredible insecurity. Not at age 68, but at age 18, age 25, age 30. And uh, if you take stock of where that is, there's a reason that the conversation that a lot of folks, not just in Silicon Valley, but uh, across the country are having these days is about portable benefits. And it's because uh, people move jobs, they don't have the same kind of reliability, they don't have the same kind of infrastructure to rely on. And what, what, what uh, I think people, not just young people, but people across the board need is fundamental security, not just after retirement, but while they're working. So the group that I co-chair, we do make the case that what we need in the United States is an income floor. So similar in Social Security, and that'd be cash, if, uh, efficiently uh, 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 delivered, not only to eradicate poverty, but to provide economic opportunity. Uh, there's an immense amount of research at the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a cash uh, program, uh, provides people not just security, but the opportunity to climb the economic ladder. So the, the, I, I, would, I would reframe the whole conversation around not like how do we patch social security in the short term. Of course, we need to do that, and there are people on the panel who are deeper experts at that than me, but how do we create the, t take the values of social security that work so well, that make it so popular, and ensure that every American, whatever age, can actually uh, uh, benefit from it, not just when they're 68, but when they're when they're uh, working in the gig economy of today. And, and so how do you piece that together? Because, I mean, you, you need to do the Social Security patch, which is something like 1% of GDP, whatever way you decide to fix it. You need to do something to shore up Medicare and other health care entitlements that are going to cost more than, than the current financing streams that are available. And then to, to pay, basically, it's $6,000 a year to not every American, but people who are working and make less than $50,000 or parents. I, how much does how much money does that all add up to, and where and where do you get it? You got to raise a lot of revenue. I mean, that maybe not make me uh, uh, yeah. popular in every room, but um, so I make the case for a modernized DITC that would provide an income floor of five hundred dollars a month to every working American 
makes the median wage on down. So this is, for those of you who are familiar with the rough size of the earned income tax credit now, it's a three to four times uh, expansion of it, making it monthly, and expanding the definition of work to include things like child care, elder care, uh, uh, what's been con considered untraditional work. Something along those lines would, would have poverty in the United States overnight. So 20 million people would be lifted out of poverty. And it would cost nearly $300 billion. Which, annually. Annually, mm -hmm. which is clearly a meaningful amount of money. So it's it like is, just however, shy of 1.5% of GDP. It is, it, yeah. it, it is on that order of magnitude. Yeah. Questions around economic, you know, how much it grows the pie are, are, mm -hmm. um, are the kinds of dynamic modeling that still need to be done. It is, however, very much affordable. I mean, I am part of the not just 1%, but 0.1%. If you bring my taxes back into line, which with where they were for most of the 20th century when we had the broadest base, base growth and growth rates that were much more significant, and close the capital gains loophole, you could pay for this. So the question to me, and what I feel where, where the, the conversation amongst folks in their 20s and 30s that's brewing right now, is, uh, isn't so much, well, does this math work or does that math work? It's what is the social contract of the future? What do we owe with another, one another? Do we want to be the generation that eradicates poverty? And in so doing, can we create a country where, where, where we actually take care of one another? And I think those values are shifting so much. So the, we got to make the math work, but we can't lose sight of how quickly the conversation in the United States amongst uh, uh, millennials in particular is changing. So what do you guys make of this proposition? We talked about you know, the, the, the big question is, what are, what are these programs for? And so Chris's proposition is that insecurity is not just for the retired, and that we need a, a significant income support program that is you know, broadly across the society, and that we should devote something like 1.5% of GDP, give or take, to paying for that on top of the programs that, that we have now, and we need a revenue stream for that. Um, Anyone? So, yeah. so I'll jump in because first I think it's the exact right. I'm fascinated with the idea. I want to learn more about it. But it's the right discussion to be having for this moment because the entire nature of our economy, how capitalism is going to work, our role in the world, all these things are changing at a pace that we have never experienced in terms of massive changes, massive structural changes. And to Andrew's point, if we're sitting there and saying, like, well, if I raise the payroll tax rate by 1% and this, like, we're missing the whole big picture. So that's the discussion I think we should be having. Um, secondly, I do think no matter what, we will always in this country have the fight between conservatives and progressives on what the size of government should be. And so one of the concerns I have about not worrying about how we fix Social Security is for many, many years, I, thought th I think this point is so interesting, that the insecurity mm -hmm. in this country now is for people entering the workforce and people not knowing what their life ex lifetime work is going to look like, what the future of work is going to look like. There's the optimistic and the pessimistic scenarios. We don't know. But we're not building the social structures to accommodate those risks at all. And um, so what I don't think you can do is wish away the resource issue. Um, because there will always be the fight about how much people are willing to pay. And one question I've been thinking about, this is a small thought on what you just said, but as the, the whatever percent of the 1%, I guess I'm, I think there's a lot of money to be raised, but I am worried about the mobility of the super wealthy. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder if we solve a bunch of these problems by saying we're going to put your and other people's tax rates up to where I think they should be, probably, are people going to move? So that's just kind of a side question. But I'm worried there are a whole lot of islands that are going to become countries that people are going to say, I'm actually not supporting <laughs> these lot, five new ideas. A lot but of the their money is already on those on islands. Those islands. <laughs> but the bottom line is, should we be building social systems that both create insurance against all the huge work, uh, huge risks that work is going to have, and also much more in terms of investment so people are able to compete in this? Of course we should. And so many of our res resources are tied up in our old social programs without thinking about if they're the most important goals. I think you have to have a comprehensive look at our federal budget. Jared, we were having a conversation earlier this week about sort of the, you know, big ideas versus small ideas. Is this the sort of big idea that Democrats should be taking up right now, this sort of, you know, I think it is. You know, I think I, I, I really like Chris's idea, and I, I really like the way uh, Maya just uh, keyed it up. As, as uh, in, in my view, uh, and this may be a non-millennial way to frame it, uh, I'm sure it is, uh, it, it's, it, it's another, as, and this is, uh, I think, what Maya was getting at, it's another form of insurance. One of the things we've seen for middle and low wage workers is that their pay hasn't kept up with productivity by a long shot. It's stagnated. Uh, 
uh, ever since 1980. The median compensation is up, you know, way less than a percent per year. I mean, uh, less than half a percent per year. And so the idea of an earned income tax credit is a form of, uh, of, of wage insurance to make sure that low-income workers don't, uh, you know, can, can, can uh, maintain at least a, a somewhat decent standard of living. Getting back to the Social Security point, because while we, yes, we need big ideas, but I'm still wedded to fixing Social Security and Medicare. <laughs> so I think that, I don't know if that's a small idea or whatever, but I, I, I think it's actually a very important uh, idea, both politically and fiscally. And I just want to say one thing, again, riffing off something Maya said. So I, I totally take the point that, especially when you, you bring Chris's idea into this, we're talking about bigger versus smaller government. But I'm not sure I would put the Social Security question in that mix, maybe not even the Medicare either. Yes, it will take more revenue for, for a fixed amount of time, as us old baby boomers move through the system, in order to meet current obligations. So this is a demographic trend. Uh, this is being driven by the fact that a, an increased share of our population is in, is in uh, the years when they, when they get Social Security. And that, to me, is maintaining government services. It's not growing the government in any sort of fundamental way. Now, there are people on my side, the progressive side of the argument, who very much want to expand Social Security. And I'm open to those kinds of arguments. And Chris is talking about a different kind of expansion. But I do want to kind of separate those two. I think they're both important. I, I, think, that, I think we need to, I, I think we're still wishing away the resource aspect of this. Yeah. Too much. No, I agree with you. Because I wanted to make that, but let me just quickly say I did want yeah. to say uh, we can't really just sort of wave hands and say assume a bunch of revenue. Right, because I mean we have one political party where like most of, most people yeah. who are elected as Republicans sign a pledge that they will never vote for any sort of tax yeah. increase, yeah. and then you have another political party that in practice has like has cordoned off almost the entire population yep. as being ineligible for a tax increase. That's Families exactly. under 200,000 or 250,000. 450. Yes. 400 is the, the new 200. Yeah. The, the, last, <laughs> the last significant um, uh, middle income tax increase was the gas tax increase that we had in 1993. Three, yeah. So and 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 so you can identify. You can say, well, we'll tax rich people more, and you get a fair amount of money from that. But the problem I feel like is people often identify a revenue source that's enough for one thing, and then they they apply it simultaneously <laughs> to five different ideas that will cost about that. And so like, uh, and I, it will now be repealing the tax cuts, which I'd be okay with. But I think we're gonna spend that money ten times over. And right. But there, but there so, are other sources. Well, there are other sources carbon. of revenue. Repealing the tax cut, a carbon tax. Carbon. You could tax the data that, you know, fuels Facebook and Google's corporate profits. I mean, listen, I'm not saying that taxes are always good, and, and clearly mm -hmm. I don't want to pay more tax unless I know it's going to something that's 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 going to make the world a better place. But I, I think that the idea that we that we can't push on that conversation is Giving up too soon. But so then you have to do you have to tell middle income people that they should expect to pay more tax in order to receive more services? I think it's okay to say to the folks who are part of the top one, two, five percent that who are doing historically better than they have in generations and who have eaten all the gains mm -hmm. over the past four decades that they need to pay their fair share. And voters consistently over sixty percent also agree with that. Now Well, but how much revenue do you think you can get out of just that set of people? I mean, that's a significant amount. I mean, I think if you, you could bring tax rates back up to certainly where they were before the, the Trump tax bill, even higher. I mean, it's a question like at what rate? I would I would call for raising them up to 50% on income above 250K, where they were for much of the post-World War II period. Because, I mean, Bernie Sanders had a had a single-payer proposal as part of his 2016 campaign, and this was, the I think, the most widely discussed, like, really large expansion of, of government proposal. And he had big tax increases on people with high income and I, I believe got about uh, somewhere in the ballpark of $2 trillion over a decade out of that. Um, but he needed, you know, $15 trillion or thereabout. Right. And so most of the money had to come from a payroll tax increase that would apply with a broad base. And he was out there saying, you know, well, we, this is, you know, a, a good expansion of government. It will replace your private insurance. And so that's a saving to you. So that's an argument that you need to be willing to pay for. Because, I, you know, I, I think, you know, you're right that you can get a really significant amount of money out of people with high incomes. I'm just skeptical of the idea that you can pay for all, all of the items on, on, on the existing wish list, including Medicare, which we haven't even talked about, which is going to need a significant amount of money just to shore up the benefit set that we have now and to do these other things. So the, I'm, I'm just wondering about, you know, when, 
when we need to level with the middle class about the idea that you know they're they're on the hook for at least part of these expansions of the government. I think this hits on yeah. I mean, just a, a big picture difference, say between the U.S. and Europe. If you yeah. if you speak to somebody in Europe, they'll say, "Look, I pay high taxes. We get good services. I'm happy to pay those high taxes." The difference I think in the U.S. is there's a lot of people who want a lot of services. But there are, but people don't want to pay taxes. It is, and so I think this gets the resource issue. I think is is is, is serious because the way our pol our politics work and the way our political structures work, we have different uh, parts of government all who have veto power. It is far far easier to play defense on a proposal than to play offense. Meaning, it is very easy to stop something from happening. And so it's, you know, I mean, I think about the, you know, the, the Bush Social Security reforms. We didn't even come close to, to passing those. Uh, the, the Affordable Care Act, the Democrats had much bigger majorities than they got there by the skin of their teeth. It's very, very hard to pass these kinds of things. I think, I mean, Chris makes a good point, though, in the sense of expanding the EITC. If you're looking to broaden the base and say, how do we get more people to support something, that is something that I think more conservatives could support because it's work oriented. It's, it's rewarding things. Things, you know, like it or not, people like to reward virtues, and they see hard work as one of them. And so I think that has much more uh, potential for success than saying we're just have, you know guaranteed minimum income or whatever. That something like that would be a much heavier lift. I just wanted it. to make a quick point. So I think um, Andrew <coughs> is pointing out a very important dynamic that I have become increasingly frustrated with as a creature of the swamp for many mm -hmm. decades, um, which is that. Um, it's, it's, it's that the, the political class, and th this is, Maya kind of lives in the space I'm about to articulate. You know, the, polit the politicians uh, have gotten into a habit of telling people that you can have this much and it will cost that much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what you're sort of saying, Josh, and mm. I'm not even sure I 100% agree with you, is that, well, you know, of course you can't have this much and collect that much. You have to have those numbers be, be closer together. Well, um, you know, I hate to bring up the tax cut again, but uh, but Republicans <clears throat> decided that no, you can have this many tax cuts and lose uh, uh, you know, two trillion dollars in revenue, percent of GDP over over ten years, and like somehow that's okay. Well, that's sending a message that there there that that the this notion of having a pay for is just an antiquated old thing that uh, you don't have to worry about at all. I happen to believe that those. Those uh, levers have to come together more closely, but we are in a world where deficit financing, we are in a post-tax cut world where deficit financing is unfortunately a robust option. So, Josh, I think it's great that you started this discussion because it is so important. We are at a moment where nobody wants to tell the truth about this. So for a long time, Republicans have said, no new taxes, I'm not going to raise taxes. Then they cut taxes and, and they don't cut the spending, they make the situation worse. But it has gotten bad on the Democratic side too, where they say, we're only taxing millionaires and billionaires, and there isn't enough revenue for, though it's interesting in taxing data, I have to learn more about that, but there wasn't enough revenue in the places people are pretending that, that it will be so painless. And that's the whole goal, make political promises that it's absolutely painless. And there's both an economic cost to this and kind of a, a resource cost, but the economic cost, of course, is that if your deficit is too high, your debt is too high, there's lots of risks that go with that from how do you deal with the next recession to the fact that now if interest rates go up by 1%, our interest payments would grow by $190 billion a year. We're vulnerable to this. There's lots of the downsides on the economic front, but it also means we don't evaluate whether something is worth it. Because if it's only, if you're only paying 50% of the dollar, then a lot of things seem worth doing. And so if we went through the exercise of what are your priorities? This is what a budget's supposed to be. We actually don't have a budget in the country most of the time, but what you're supposed to do for budgeting is determine what your national priorities are, what the best way to actually achieve those is, and then how you're going to pay for them. And so often, if the end now is, if the, the, the story is, this uh, is so pro-growth it will pay for itself, the story that was on the tax cut, which could not be farther from the truth, it's not gonna come close to paying for itself, or the line that this is so important we shouldn't have to pay for it, which is kind of backwards. This is so important that we should pay for it. So we've now gotten, and I agree with Jared, that we are in a moment of just, it's a fiscal free-for-all. Nobody believes they need to pay for anything. So there's not, not the hurdle question of is it worth it to do something. 
Can we talk some about healthcare? Because I think you know that we we focused on a lot of the parts of of the entitlement state that really are just sort of this cash in cash out stuff, and mm -hmm. they're really you you can only get as much cash out as you take in over the long run. With healthcare, we have all these questions about: Are we getting good value for money? Is there a way to provide the benefits that we're currently providing more cheaply? I think it's very interesting that we've seen you know the Medicare projections, even though Medicare is sort of the like the the part that is supposed to grow you know alarmingly fast. It's not quite as alarming as it looked 10 years ago. Spending growth has come in under trend. Are there things that we should be thinking about where the, we really can have a conversation about getting the same thing and, and spending less for it? And, and what does that look like? I mean, it's, it's very much a matter of cost control. And I think the important thing to understand in that part of the debate is, again, coming from more of a progressive position, is that it's very, it, it, you have to be careful not to conflate uh, cost savings with uh, cost shifting. Cost savings uh, have to be achieved, and the very w wonky way you say it is, you know, you're, you're trying to slow down or bend the cost curve, all of that, and Josh is sort of suggesting that's, that's been occurring uh, lately, and, and, and there's definitely some truth to that. Um, there looks to be maybe some recessionary impacts on that, but some of the, <coughs> some of the things in the Affordable Care Act may have helped a little bit. Uh, but I think that the real work on cost savings versus cost shifting, I think the cost shifting problem is one which basically says, go ahead, people, you pay for it yourself. Good luck, you're on your own. Here's some very scaled down, very high deductible insurance uh, uh, package that uh, you know hopefully you'll be able to deal with when you get sick. To me, that um, uh, just like we were talking about retirement security, which I think Social Security goes a long way to help solving, that's just invoking uh, healthcare insecurity, which Medicare is uh, uh, again uh, an excellent solution for and one that is is much uh, loved. But we have to bring the cost down. And here I have another un un unfortunate message, which is that I think the two most potent cost controllers that we tried to do in the in the Obama administration were the uh, uh, this this payment advisory board, which essentially triggered on cost control if costs accelerated too quickly, and this Cadillac tax, which uh, char which um, uh, uh, was a tax on uh, uh, high end uh, employer provided insurance plans. Both of those have been drop kicked out of Congress uh, pretty much. So we need to control costs. Those are two good ways to do it, and neither of them are, func are, are in play. Although interestingly, I mean, IPAB, the payment board, before they got rid of it, it was not getting, it kept not getting triggered because the costs were already coming in low enough. It was enough. 12 basis for points from getting triggered at the, <laughs> when last seen, so it got yes. close, but you're right. Yeah. You're right. So, but I guess, you know, Andrew, the, Jared draws this distinction between cost sharing and cost shifting. And one of the theories about cost shifting is that when you shift costs onto individuals, they become more cost conscious and it redu it, uh, you end up with reduced total costs. Skin in the game, right? So is that is that important as part of these reforms? I was reading just the other day before I left, uh, Consumer Reports magazine, is this whole thing about prescription drugs. And here, and it's very costly. Here's a, all these different strategies you can use, talk to different people by getting better uh, deals through prescription drugs. And this is all because it's Consumer Reports. It, it's all framed in the part of, oh, this is a terrible thing, you have to do it, but the drug companies are ripping you off. And the drug companies may well be ripping you off. <laughs> but the reason they're, uh, they're saying you need to go look is now people have skin in the game. So it's, I think there really is something to that. At the same time, though, I don't know whether there's enough to it in, in the sense that you, 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 I'm shifting to the right a little bit on things like Social Security. On things like health care, I, 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 you know, I look around the world on something like retirement. I find a lot of different models that work pretty well that are very compatible with my sort of philosophical priors on this. I don't see very many health care systems that work very well that way. I see a lot of health care systems that I don't like philosophically, but they get the job done and in the sense of providing decent care to people at, at a reasonable cost. But again, it gets to this culture of, you know, Americans don't like to pay taxes, but they like to get everything quickly. Just a, a quick anecdote. I was in grad school in London. A woman I was dating at the time needed to get a sonogram for something or other. They book her uh, uh, an appointment six weeks out. At the same time, my mother calls, and the golden retriever has a heart murmur. <laughs> the golden retriever's in for a sonogram the next day. Mm -hmm. And it's just, and we have to. Which she must have paid for out of pocket. But oh, she did. It was, in, it was an inoperable heart murmur. There's nothing you do about it anyway, but she just wanted to know for sure. You know, it's, a, this, it's this crazy stuff that we have. And, but I just don't know. Yeah, 
with, um, with the, the, the healthcare system where we, we have now, we have people who have very little health care at all, uh, very basic care, and then we have this extraordinary level of technology that some people get. It's very tough to contain costs in that sort of world because the peop you can't possibly provide the best to everybody, and other countries don't do it. But when you have an environment where people are constantly exposed to the, re to the best, they see all these things, then the government has to go out and say, you can't have that. So how would, you how would you feel about Medicare for all, or Medicare for most, or something like that? If, so Medicare if, for most? If Medicare were itself not going broke, I'd feel a little bit better about it. I mean, it's just, you know, okay, the Medicare situation is a little bit better than it was, uh, say, 10 years ago, but it's still not good. And so it does, you know, again, if you go back 10 years to, you know, pre-ACA, the whole deal was all oh, health care, that's the, you know, it's not, not this demographic stuff. Forget about the aging of the population. It's all health care. And we still do have a substantial amount of health care inflation, and, and you still have a substantial amount of that in Medicare. But my only point is that if you look at the other countries who spend eight percentage points of GDP less than we do, which is just a tremendous waste that's ongoing every year, they typically have some form of, if not you know, Medicare for all or single payer, it's not all single payer, but a much more heavily regulated system than we have. So I believe, in, unless there's some magic fairy dust that exists in Europe and doesn't exist here, which there isn't, um, I, I, I believe we could get there, but um, many people who are currently benefiting from rents within the, the current system would have to be dinged pretty hard. Systems yeah. that I mean, use some sort of... I think we're going to end sorry? up. Sorry? I think we're going to end up in the direction. Well, I hope yeah. so. Yeah. so Go, go ahead. Healthcare yeah. comments? Do you want more yes. or you want to move? Okay. So I just think the way we have the healthcare discussion in this country, not this panel, but the country, is <laughs> so poor and so bad and so non transparent. Um, and we probably, the last presidential election probably was a, a good sign that people actually don't want economic tutorials in our political system. It's not, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but when we were talking about repealing Obamacare, the quality of the discussion, I mean, besides the absurdity of the whole political show, could not have been worse. And I think about health insurance, and it actually does so many things, right? It creates insurance against huge risks. It creates um, forced savings for big things like births, things that are going to happen that aren't really risks, but you don't have the money at the moment. Um, and it has subsidies from, uh, from rich to poor or from young to old. And all of those are just put together in one big soupy mess and then not pulled out. And so I think we need to think more about, back to Andrew's original point of like, what are you trying to do in a policy? Try to think about what our goals are. And the ACA, one of the things that I've really thought a lot about is how much do we want to subsidize the elderly versus the young? Um, their costs are much more, but many of them have more money. And back to this point, I think is so interesting. The biggest risks right now are going into young professionals, not the elderly. Um, but there are a lot, we're going to have to do a bunch of policies. Jared is right that IPAB, uh, I think, should have been expanded, not gotten rid of. That support for the Cadillac tax are getting rid of the health care exclusion in our tax code. So many subsidies in our tax code, by the way, drive up the cost of the thing that we're trying to help make more affordable. It has the reverse effect. But those are really important. I also think, ironically, when you talk about health insurance, higher premiums and higher co-payments, the skin in the game that you brought up, help people be thoughtful consumers of health care when it's appropriate, but shouldn't be there when you have a medical emergency. But we don't distinguish those things. Um, and figuring out what, when providers don't have to be doctors, you know, the different kinds of the AMA has all these controls. This is going to be a messy patchwork of things. But if we don't start the discussion like you would in a policy class, but what are you trying to achieve? What are the different goals? We'll continue to have this huge soupy mess in healthcare that we I do have. I just, one quick thought to just to tack on on the healthcare stuff. I do mm -hmm. think that there are signs of some innovation in private healthcare companies. One that I follow pretty closely is this uh, company, Oscar, that uh, uh, operates in, has historically operated in several states. They it's use a, big, an insurer. It's an insurer, and they, yeah. it's an insurer and a new insurance, startup insurance company, and they use big data analytics to understand which doctors are the highest quality and which, over the long term, reduce the, um, the cost of care for their patients. Now, ironically, they are constraining choice significantly for the people that they insure, but the set of providers that they're doing are the highest quality. And so people uh, uh, seemingly seem to be fine with that trade. And so who knows if that will be as successful of a company as they w want us all to believe. But the point is, is they are using the, the big data analytics and the insights that can be derived from it to create 
a more uh, efficient business model that should be good for the consumers in the long and the patients in the long term too. So I don't think that's going to solve all of these problems, but there are signs of innovation that that the sector, uh, the private sector on, in this category is changing. Do you see an expansion of of healthcare guarantees to people below retirement age as as a priority? for the left right now? Should we be letting people buy into Medicare? Should I we be giving everyone Medicare? Anything that makes government services simpler and more accessible will be politically popular in the long run. So if it's Medicare for all, Medicare for most, or just the opportunity to say to a 25 or a 30 year old, you need health insurance, it's expensive, the cheapest option is provided by the government rather than Oscar, buy it. You know, anything that can take what is such a convoluted soup and make it and make it simple, I think, can do two things. Not only help bend the cost curve and get more young people actually buying the insurance and participating, it can also challenge the current relationship to government, which I think is is this insidious thing that is the backdrop for much of this conversation. So, Josh, is that people sorry. don't trust government to, to figure out the solution. So we have to demonstrate that government, even if it's not always the answer, can at times be a very effective program as Medicare is for the people who, who benefit. I know we have to get the audience, but I just wanted to, you just triggered a, 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 just an anecdote or a framing thought mm -hmm. that I wanted to, 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 to mention before we stop. So when I hear people, Bernie Sanders is a good example of this, when I hear people talk about um, some very big changes of the type that we're discussing in healthcare, um, I, th I feel like they lack path dependency. Now maybe I'm too path dependent, but when we were in the Obama administration, we were thinking about reforming health care, we believed we had to go through the insurers, that we couldn't just somehow keep them out of the picture, and that ends up with the soupy mess um, that you described. And I'm not saying that's optimal at all. I very much agree with, with uh, castigating the soup. Uh, but that said, it's never been clear to me how you get from here to there. How, it, it, it's some, of these, some of these very progressive debates, and I, I very much align myself with the goals, so, sign, so, sound like you're getting from A to Z without going through B and all the other letters. <laughs> And I'm not quite sure how that happens. Well, I think the idea there with the sort of the Medicare buy-in thing is that is that it recognizes that path dependence. That particularly people, most people like the insurance that they have right now. The insur uh, the, the system is too expensive for everyone, but it is, the majority of people are like are getting access to care that they need, and they they feel broadly satisfied. And so they 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 react very negatively against anything that would take away their plan. And so the idea is you let Medicare compete against the private right. insurers that it has a, a price advantage because it is able to to negotiate lower prices with providers and has other other advantages from being in the public sector and that maybe over time at least the theory from a lot of people on yeah. the left is that because of that price advantage it ends up taking up yeah. almost so the, entire the public market. option because every and so you you get this thing where people choose over time to, to end up in it and almost everyone opts for it now often that's not you individually it would be your employer opting that Medicare mm -hmm. is going to be your yeah so I think there are still significant path dependency issues there but I think that I, I think I think I you're think right you, that, you make a good point yeah um, let's take some questions from the audience. Um, this fellow right here in the front. I was hoping you could talk about the issue of intergenerational wealth transfer and the morality of that. In addition to this dystopian soup we have at the state level, <laughs> massive unfunded liabilities. Mm. People are going to be paying more and getting less. And my advice to my daughter, who's a senior in high school, is set your sights low because if you strive and work hard and earn a lot of money, you're going to have a target on your back to pay for old bills. <laughs> I, know, I know Andrew's done yeah. a lot on this. Yeah, I mean, in, in addition to <clears throat> working on Social Security, I've also done a lot of work on the state and local government pensions. The whole game in all of this, whether you're at the federal level or the state level, is passing the buck to the future. That's, it, it, I mean, I could, with a, with a state pension, whether it's, you know, CalPERS or I, mean, I live in Oregon where the pension is a terrible shape, it's all this sort of actuarial mumbo jumbo, and it somehow comes down to we're not going to pay our bill today and somebody else is getting in in the future. This is where the, the real conservative side of me comes out, in the sense that government more and more is this giant human resources department, which offers these very, very long-term commitments to people. Okay, if you enter the workforce today, we're gonna, you're going to start earning credits for retirement, uh, you know, your Social Security income, your, your health care, your pensions, whatever. So there's very long-term commitments being managed by people whose time horizon is from now to the next election. 
And it, it just, in my opinion, doesn't work. There's always going to be, I mean, you know, just an example of, since we, since we mentioned Bernie Sanders, who, who I like in a lot of ways. He's a refreshing <laughs> guy. But, you know, okay, Social Security's underfunded. He comes out with a reform plan for Social Security that would obviously, uh, it would expand benefits, it would increase taxes by, you know, probably more than is politically feasible. But it, it would use the extra money to expand benefits. It wouldn't fix the solvency problem. And so it was all, OK, how do we just you know, sweeten it up front and kick the can to people in the future? That's, it, it, it is just inevitable with human nature. How, how should we think about these magnitudes? Because this comes back to like the, you know, the collision thing in the title. This is how people often talk about these, these state pension systems. And you get these eye-watering numbers, like there's $100 billion un unfunded. But these are payments that are made over a series of decades. So if you're thinking about like how much extra state tax am I going to pay because people ran up this debt and I have to pay it off. In the, in the states that are badly off, is that like 1% of gross state product? Is it, f is it three or four? Like how, how big a disadvantage is it to be somewhere like Illinois that has a big problem with this compared to being somewhere like Wisconsin where the system I used to know these numbers well. off I used to know the numbers off the top of my head I'll just I'll put it in the context of you know we have a, te we have a debate now about teacher pay yeah. where the two sc school teachers saying we're not getting paid enough and I, I'll be honest I mean a lot of the numbers on that are not particularly good but it, it's it is true that the the states and local governments are paying an enormous amount of money now towards teachers but which is in effect not going to today's teachers it's money going to the pensions to pay off unfunded liabilities from the past so the pension uh, contributions have risen substantially you know 25 percent of employee pay going into these pension systems but half of it or more is not for today's teachers it's not compensation for them it's paying off debt from the past so it's and that's putting the squeeze on teacher salaries is putting the squeeze on money that can be used in the classroom so it's it, it really is a substantial problem it differs from state to state I tend to think your Illinois and your New Jersey's are maybe beyond saving uh, one of my side gigs is I'm on the federal sort of bankruptcy board for Puerto Rico which they just ran their pension to zero and they were told year after year you have to fund this thing and they said well instead of funding how about if we increase benefits now you have zero and we have the choice between Cutting, pen cutting pensions for retirees, stiffing the bondholders, cutting education, cutting health. The reality is we're going to do all of those things because just a couple we ran of, out of money. Uh, just a couple of con uh, uh, diff different points. So first of all, um, there are definitely basket cases, but most state pension funds are not basket cases. So that's point one. Point two, in fact, if you look at the results of these teacher strikes, yes, they help uh, on the pension side, but in every case, and there's only a few that they've been resolved, they've increased teachers' salaries. That's actually been the main part of the resolution, and they increase funding for schools. So I just wanted to correct those. But I, I just think this is the, the absolute right question, because if you look at the numbers, the richest cohort are those over 65. It's not as true when you're older, over 85. The old, old have a, a poverty problem, but the richest cohort in this country is people over 65, and the poorest is children under 18. And this is not the American dream. This is not that each generation is going to leave the next generation better off than, than they were. And it's so much of the reason is because one of the easiest things to do politically is make huge promises that are costless for the future, but you get the gain of it now. And there's all sorts of examples, but something like a Roth IRA, which is one of the biggest budget gimmicks out there. But it's something where you save money. Mm -hmm. And you get the taxes immediately, and it will never be taxed again. So you're take, it's a resource grab. We see this all the time. It's similar. It's the mirror image of promising big benefits down the road. And we have something called the Joint Select Committee in Washington, which is changing how we, how we do budget process. And one of the things I was playing around with is pay-go. It means you have to offset the cost of something. But could there be an intergenerational pay-go, where right now, and my numbers aren't right, and they're not the states, because I once went to my board and said, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, we should deal with the states. And they said, like, look at how bad a job you've done on the federal budget. <laughs> maybe, maybe let someone else do that. That's a true story, unfortunately. But, but it, it, if you look at um, how much we've promised, we've promised, I think, spending about 26% of GDP down the road, and we're taxing it about 17%. I think there should be more of a restriction where you can't make spending promises that are higher than you're willing to pay today, which doesn't mean you'd have to cut the spending. It could mean we would increase our revenues. But this intergenerational promise that the next generation will do more to finance than we're willing to seems fundamentally unfair to your daughter and the full generation. To ask a technical question, does that mean the budget window should be longer than 10 years? 
that we well, should Well, sometimes it does. First off, we don't have the ability to do very smart projections depending on what the programs are. Right. But I do think for one thing you could do is give credit in budget rules scoring for savings that save over the long term. So if mm -hmm. people are willing to raise the retirement age but it doesn't kick in for another decade, to find a way to give today's Congress credit for making a hard choice even if it's down the road. Yeah, although, I mean, we, we saw this that with you Medicare. Think it's yeah. where you, you, you promise you're going to cut in the future yeah. and then the future yeah. comes. The trick is to like, figure no, out like, when wait. it's a total BS <laughs> lie right. versus when you're actually gradually phasing in a reasonable change. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to get back to Medicare um, yeah. and with uh, Medicare and Social Security. I mean, from the individual's point of view, um, bringing Medicare down helps Social Security because you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, with uh, Medicare coming out of Social Security benefits. But um, I'm a psychologist and a gerontologist, and I've been studying this problem from a behavioral standpoint for, mm -hmm. for years and, and keep wondering why we aren't really exploring prevention. Um, but we, we've talked here about better health care, but it's really got to be um, at the individual level and incentives given more than, I think it's $200 for joining a health club, um, to, <laughs> so to individuals to prevent poor health problems from developing, but also alternatives to medication. So the, the idea here is basically to save on, on medical expenses by getting people to have better health. A. Oh, in the long run. Yes, and yeah. B, so, to work on prescription mm -hmm. drug costs. Mm -hmm. So what do, what do we think about that? Because this is, I mean, th this was one of several yes. cost control ideas in the Affordable Care Act. My sense is that the, the feelings are very mixed about how effective this stuff is actually at changing people. I don't behavior. know if there's been any research that would connect the uh, provision of preventive care as part of the Affordable Care Act to cost savings, and I suspect that it'll be... Exactly. I suspect it'll be uh, some time before we can do that. But that was the, the idea of, 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 uh, of putting um, preventative care in as a, uh, a service that had to be provided for you uh, for, uh, for free was, you know, very much driven by the sort of thinking that, that you said. Um, we haven't talked about, and so I, I have a friend, the economist Dean Baker, who just rants on this point about how drug costs are so much higher here than any place else, and one of the reasons is because of our patent system. And I won't go into it, but boy, he has some amazingly convincing numbers, and we're talking about magnitudes 300, 350 billion dollars a year that we're paying to patent trolls who uh, uh, are extracting these, again, rents from our system. So um, that would be, I think you would, again, it, it, it's part of my theme of that if you're actually going to do cost control, the people who are benefiting from the inefficiencies are going to fight you every step of the way, but that's a fight we have to undertake. Right, but, the, but there's, there's an extra reason why this is difficult, because the, the prescription drug costs are super high on a percentage basis relative to what other people pay for prescription drugs, but the, the biggest source of, of just co of total magnitude of excess costs in healthcare in the U.S. is in outpatient care, which is to say largely pay payments to doctors, that they, they provide more services and they charge much more for those services. Yeah. And so the politics of this, you say, you know, let's, let's take on the people who are imposing all those high costs. It's like, yeah, yeah, take on the insurers, take on the pharma companies. And then when you say, no, I want your cardiologist and your dermatologist <laughs> yeah, and your no, ophthalmologist right. yeah. to make half as much money as they make now, people people are no longer No question. About I mean, the, if yeah. you compare doctor salaries here to doctor salaries in Europe, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a middle class job over there, but it's a lot closer to that than it is mm -hmm. here. And so without having any expertise on it, I think obviously we should be doing more in preventative care and you can do it both through incentives um, and through norms which change things. And there are also a lot of companies that are taking measures to do it internally. Um, but the one depressing piece of data I remember learning quite some time ago, and it had to do with quitting smoking. But the more things that you do that actually improve your health, improve your life expectancy, and make the cost of entitlements worse. <laughs> <laughs> right. They work yes. against each other. Yes. I, first of all, I want to say that each of you has said something that was very helpful and interesting and intriguing, uh, which I have to be honest, I'm very... Um, Surprise. Surprise. We, Surprise. Yeah. We, <laughs> rare panel. Yeah. We, we try here. Surprise. But you yeah. super great. That's Thank you. Here's Don't like the my issue. Wife. Um, I've worked in um, human services, past board chair of National Assembly of Human Services, all kinds of organizations. And I'm wondering, do you talk to people who provide human services, who are on the front lines of providing um, services to people and filling in the gap that's left there because mm. there's such misunderstanding about what we do and where we fit in. This issue is not just an issue of data, analytics, 
actuarial information. Mm -hmm. There is a human component of it. For instance, you all, when you say, in Europe, they like paying taxes. They want to <laughs> because they are a homogeneous society and they're taking mm -hmm. care of their people, their friends, their cousins. Mm. In this country, race mm -hmm. is infiltrated in this issue throughout. S I heard I watched a commercial. I watched uh, television. A man, a poor white man with a dirty T-shirt on, saying, "I love Donald Trump because he's a self-made man, <laughs> not <laughs> trying to live off the government like these colored people." Mm. So, so that is something that has yep. to be included. And my suggestion is that somewhere in all of the um, ethereal studies mm -hmm. and people that you mm -hmm. talk to, that you talk to people who provide human services and have close on the ground contact with these people who are going to tax this country because they are unable to be healthy and go to work. We are nearly out of time, but I, Chris, I think this okay. animates part of yeah. your, a, a related issue animates part of your proposal, which is the, the idea, it's not an unconditional income, it's conditional based on work. People have lots of opinions about entitlement programs that are based on whether they feel like the people yeah. deserving, receiving the benefits are deserving. Well, and I think, well, I think two, two, two quick answers to that. I think that everything you said is absolutely right on. I think it's one of the reasons why Social Security is so popular, because everyone feels like they paid into it and everybody else paid into it. So it isn't sort of like me having to pay for some, you know, other, if you will, that I think a lot of other uh, conversations around social benefits fall into. I also think that work really matters. So it, the, you know, if you say, oh, should welfare in the United States be, be larger? A lot of people say, no way. If you say, if someone works, should they live in poverty? 90% of people, I mean, Republicans and Democrats, all agree with that as a common kind of value. And so I do think that there are bridges here, the pay for into Social Security, the common understanding of work as a virtue that we can build on. I think we've got to be suspicious of cynical uses of work requirements as they're getting used in a lot of the debates today. But, um, but I think that we can talk about some of these common values to, to bridge, uh, bridge our differences, or at least I hope so. We're out of time. I want to thank everybody for coming today. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.